The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Great, thank you uh, very much, Pedro. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Drs. Pan and Wang and uh, Professor Zhang from Harbin Institute of Technology in China, who I've been collaborating with, geez, for a good five or six years now. So the work I'm presenting today was conducted by the first author uh, for part of his PhD uh, work. So we will be using a, a method of analysis to investigate the effect of uh, FRP strengthening on reinforced concrete frames with masonry infills. We'll also be uh, talking about the effect of the masonry infills on the frames. Uh, so first of all, a, a background, and then uh, the, the posing of the research question, which we'll address today. Then the frame that, that we have chosen, as well as the FRP strengthening details, then information about the modeling, and finally the results and the conclusions. Um, and I will spend, I guess, a lot more time on the results and the interpretation of the results. So by means of a background, Reinforced concrete frames, it's a, it's a very uh, popular framing structure used in buildings around the world. Uh, a, a lot, or a considerable portion, will have masonry infill walls. Whether they're internal walls or external walls, the walls are generally not included in the design of the RC frame. They're independent of the RC frame design, although in reality, they can influence the, the behavior of the frame at least the stiffness, and then that's going to have repercussions when, it's, when the frame is subjected to seismic loading. So there's, there's generally no explicit connection between the, the masonry infill and the frame, although that would be expected to resist substantial loads. So under a seismic attack, a frame would move and the masonry infill walls could fail. They could fail out of plane. So if walls fail, then the, the dynamics, the stiffness of the structure can change. There's really been limited research that we've found in this field. If we lost all of the, the walls in one story, for example, then this could lead to a, a soft story, a failure of the frame. So we found limited modelling in this area, and even more limited work of the uh, effect of FRP strengthening. In particular, the, the ability of the FRP to restrain the uh, masonry walls. So the, the research question we pose, we want to investigate the effectiveness of varying distributions of FRP strengthening. We're confining our strengthening to the columns and the masonry infills. Upon the seismic performance um, of existing low-rise RC frames that are vulnerable to masonry infill out-of-plane failure. It's a, it's a very specific research question, but it is uh, a, an issue that can occur. We're using a Perform 3D software um, that's produced by um, computers and structures. It's a non-linear analysis, performance assessment of 3D structures subjected to seismic loads. It, uh, it implements the ASCE 41 seismic rehabilitation of existing buildings. Also consider second order effects. So the incremental uh, dynamic uh, method of analysis, which I won't go into any great detail about because I'm more interested in the results arising from the method of analysis, nonlinear dynamic analysis, we can investigate a, a suite of ground motions, investigate the uh, response of the structure from an elastic to a, a global dynamic instability mode. We are generating a series of peak round acceleration versus uh, interstory drift ratio curves. And from those curves, we're extracting the, uh, what we'll refer to as the limit state capacities of PGA and, and IDR. And so these are extracted at a 20% at a of the, the tangent slope. Now, the, uh, the frame that we have created 
a fictitious frame. It's, uh, it's a three bay, a five story frame with uh, masonry infills. We can see here the, uh, the geometry and the detailing of the columns and also the beams. It's a gravity load design frame according to the uh, Chinese code for concrete structures. So there has been no wind and no seismic design of this frame. Uh, so we can see that the, the columns are reinforced with either 22 or 18 millimeter diameter bars and the, the main flexural reinforcement for the beams for the for floors one to four, uh, three 22 millimeter diameter bars and then we have a smaller beam for the roof. Uh, the, the loading is around the, the, the 10 kPa mark, although that's, that's not too important for this presentation. <coughs> So that's the frame. The, uh, the FRP configurations that we've proposed are presented here. So we're providing strengthening to the columns either beneath the floor or just above the floor. And so the, uh, the length of the, uh, the wrapping, it's a carbon fiber wrap, there's four layers of wrap around the columns. It's one and a half times the, uh, the depth of the column. Uh, and we've also uh, provided FRP strengthening on the masonry infields. So one of the motivations for this uh, work was to stop that out of plant failure of the infills. So we've got this, uh, these two diagonal uh, strips of FRP. The FRP is only going to work in tension, hence the two directions for the, the change in loading direction. Now, uh, we have not considered debonding in the analysis. Uh, so there is a, a rupture strain that we're working to. So to ensure that there's no debonding, we've in, installed, well, fictitiously, a series of anchors. And we're assuming that there's enough anchors in there to have reach uh, a fracture of the FRP. And we've also uh, anchored the, um, the FRP into the, the frame, so there won't be any separation there. But again, this, this is not modelled, so we're assuming that there is a, a perfect connection between the FRP and the frame. Uh, so the FRP is, is resisting tension only forces. Now, uh, we uh, have proposed 15 different strengthening scenarios. So these are broken into the three rows here. So first of all, columns only. So these would be schemes one to five where we've strengthened the first story, the first to second, the first to the third, and so on for the whole height of the frame. Now the second row, so schemes six to 10, refer to strengthening the infills only. So this is strengthening the ground floor, the first two floors, and all the way up to the, the full height of the frame. Now the third strengthening scenario is the strengthening of the columns and the infills. So these are schemes 11 to 15. And again, reaching from the ground floor right the way up to the top of the structure. We have not uh, incorporated any strengthening of the beams given that it's a gravity load design frame, seismic loading, so the column's going to become more vulnerable. And there, there have been other studies, other numerical studies in the literature uh, that have also uh, uh, preferred the column strengthening over the beam strengthening. So this is a, a, a typical ground floor here, where here's the extent of the column strengthening, the top and bottom of each column, and these are the, uh, the diagonal FRP strips. So this is the, the modeling of a typical beam and a typical column uh, using a collection of steel or stirrup confined concrete core for the beam or a series of steel fibers versus a confined core within the ties of the column. So this is the, the unstrengthened part. Now for the, the strengthened extents of the column, we uh, again have our steel fiber elements, but now we have the whole column as, as being confined by FRP. The confinement model that we're using was developed in an earlier study that uh, my colleagues and I published in, a, in 2012. We strengthened a series of um, uh, square RC columns. I won't give the details of that model, it's, it can be found in no reference but that model was developed for uh, cyclic loading states. Now, to model the infill, 
we have uh, modelled the walls as equivalent diagonal compression-only struts. So we've used a, a, a simple bar element in the package, uh, and we've, we've got, uh, incorporated an element removal strategy so that we can uh, take into account progressive failure or out-of-plane out of failure of the wall. The uh, constitutive model of concrete and the constitutive model of standard steel reinforcement. There's nothing uh, different there about what we'd normally see. Okay, so to test out the modeling technique, we modeled uh, a frame that was reported in this publication by Hashemi and Mosulam in 2006 and under three different ground motions. Uh, and we, we found uh, a, a reasonably close and an acceptable correlation between our model uh, and these test results. Uh, and there was a, a variation of the fundamental period of only about 5%. So with that uh, confidence in the modelling, we went, then went on to look at our particular study. So we've modelled uh, 15, oh, sorry, nine different uh, ground motions from very well known and, and well documented and uh, accessible data from these nine earthquakes. Now these uh, ground motions can be roughly divided into three main categories of low, medium uh, and, and high frequency earthquakes. So we've distinguished the effect of these uh, intensity earthquakes as well. Right, so as I said earlier, we, we've plotted the, uh, the peak ground acceleration versus the interstory drift ratio and we've pulled off values at 20% of the tangent of those curves. Now what we see here is a summary of the maximum peak round uh, accelerations on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis we've got our nine different ground motions broken into low, medium uh, and high frequency earthquakes. Now the, uh, so the, the open curve here and uh, the open box here and, and the dashed one refer to uh, the NC, so that's ne neglecting any masonry wall collapse, uh, and the CC is including masonry wall collapse. That's the terminology my colleagues used. So just, just keep that in mind. Now we can see that the, uh, the, the PGA capacity for the, the walls that are not collapsing are greater all throughout compared to the walls that are going to collapse. Uh, we have here the mean for the, the walls that are um, not collapsing and the walls that are collapsing. So we find that between the, the low, the medium and the high uh, ratios that there is a noticeable difference in the average peak ground accelerations. So we, we say that this is not, say, that reliable of a damage parameter given that variation. Again, this is just for the um, the, the plain RC frame of masonry infills. We haven't touched the FRP yet. Now, uh, if we plot, rather than the peak ground acceleration, the interstory drift ratio capacity versus the ground motions, we find there's much less scatter now between the averages of the frames that are collapsing and not. Uh, so it is a reasonably average, uh, consistent average all throughout the ground motions. This is a more reliable um, damage indicating parameter for us. A couple of uh, typical results from frames. There's a whole lot of these scenarios, but uh, to give you a taste of, of what we can produce. So this first frame here, where masonry is only provided to the first floor, and if we're ne neglecting uh, the infill collapse, then we can see that the progressive formation of hinges, where we have hinges forming on these beams, then columns. Now the second frame here, if we do consider the collapse of the masonry infills, so as indicated by these, these uh, dotted lines, sorry, I should mention that the, the whole frame contains masonry infills. So this bottom floor, we lose the masonry walls and we can see the progressive formation of hinges, hinges forming the columns, a soft story is created and this flame, frame will collapse. Okay, there's a bit of information here. But this is now looking at the effect of FRP strengthening on these frames. So we've plotted the uh, peak ground acceleration ratio here versus 
the uh, CFRP strengthening scheme. So there were 15 schemes we were looking at, if you remember. So schemes one to five were for column strengthening only, six to 10 were for wall strengthening only, and 11 to 15 were for column and walls. And uh, some of the earthquakes have been plotted uh, on for each of the, uh, the strengthening schemes. But we can see here that, uh, in a ratio of one, so this is a ratio of the, the FRP strengthened frame versus the non-FRP strengthened frame. So anything greater than one is showing the enhancement provided by FRP. We can see, and this is also for low, medium, and high intensity earthquakes, we can see that really for column strengthening only, there's not that much increase. And apart from this one here, there's, there's a marginal amount. But for medium uh, and for high intensity earthquakes, the effect of just strengthening the columns hardly has any influence. Now, if we uh, strengthen the masonry walls only, we're seeing some uh, influence for the low range uh, and some for the, the medium and the high. But it's only when we strengthen the, the whole structure, uh, and so as we move up the floors from 11 up to 15, that we can see this uh, ratio uh, increasing quite dramatically. So we're reaching our peak ratio when we strengthen the whole frame with, uh, with FRP uh, for the columns and the walls. So we, we find that we need to have at least half the height of the frame strengthened with FRP for there to be a, a, a noticeable effect on this capacity. Now, a couple of the uh, frames arising um, and formation of hinges. So our, we can see our, our FRP struts here. So this is with FRP walls strengthened on the ground floor. And we can see on this uh, second floor then the masonry infills collapse and the formation of hinges here, one, two, three, and four. Um, now for floors one to three strengthened, floor four now becomes the weak floor. That's where our masonry infills, infills drop out and the formation of hinges take place in the columns. So I think this is a, makes sense. That's the, the floor above our strengthening becomes the more vulnerable floor. And final set of results. Finally, this is looking at the, um, the maximum energy levels versus the, uh, the existing columns only, infill only, and column and infill strengthened frames for low, medium to high. Uh, so each of these five numbers would refer to the, the progressive strengthening as we move up the structure. Take home message for this is a greater energy absorption, especially when we're, we're strengthening the, the whole frame. So just in conclusion from this exercise, qualitatively, for low, ground motion frequencies, the, the frame efficiency was increased with successive floor strengthening. For medium to high uh, motion frequencies, we find that the FRP becomes more beneficial as we move into the top half of the structure for a strengthening. So the most significant changes occurs when the FRP is uh, applied to the whole frame. Thank you. So we have time for questions. That's when the, the, the section is yielded. Yeah. So there's still concrete um, materials, but we are using plasticity in the modeling, but we've reached that, that plastic limit. Excessive rotations. Yeah, no, no, great question. We don't have an automated procedure. Right now it's, it's, it's a real sledgehammer. Right, we're going to put it here, we're going to put it there because we've read the, the tests from the literature and others and this is where we think failure is going to occur. Uh, that's, I think, the best we can do at this stage. But, yeah, we can certainly gain a lot of interesting insights. 
Uh, and we are able to model different extents of FR, FRP, as we can see along the columns. And this is just a gravity load design frame as well. It would be nice to look at, at uh, laterally designed frames that are under capacity in, in whatever reason, whether they're dissolved, uh, designed to evolve concrete codes, new. So I, th I think there's tremendous capability with this method, or at least the, the use of this um, analysis tool. When your incremental dynamic analysis ideas, did you look into plotting your uh, intensity measure, which you call it, I think, the MAN DM, versus yes. the spectral acceleration of your first mode? Or uh, Yes, we, we did. I, I haven't shown those results. I've, right. I've just pulled off the, the, um, the key yeah. results and, and right. showed them there. And that's for the 20% slope? Yes, that's uh, right. Okay. Yeah, so it, the, um, the intensity measure was, yeah, we plotted the intensity measure versus the, the damage measure. Right. And they were related right. to the peak ground acceleration and the interstory drift. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense that for a high AV, you have the formation of the plastic hinge higher mm -hmm. because probably you have higher mode effects. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you had looked into the, uh, the frequency content or do a fast Fourier transform to see uh, if you're picking that, uh, if you are indeed picking that up. For this study, we haven't. Correct. Right. Right. Look, we could drill down into a lot more detail for the particular ground motions or seismic events and try and understand a bit better, well, how is that frequency affecting some of these, uh, these trends? Uh, Michael, thank you. Sorry, just a question on construction quality and if, for example, the plane wasn't constructed correctly or there were deficiencies in the construction, what is the likelihood in response from FRP strengthening, for instance, the consistent model when the structure is not consistently constructed? I guess it would be nice to assess the condition of the structure as much as possible. If we, if we can get access to as much of the structure, is it, is it possible to quantify damages? Are there missing reinforcing bars? This would come down to, the, I think, the initial uh, inspection of the building, how detailed you want that model to be, and then apply FRP appropriately. Sorry, it's a very vague, non-committal type answer. I have one more question. Yeah. I don't know if retrofitting infill walls is the, the right approach. And the reason why is because you tend to stiffening up your frame quite a lot. I know you said they were gravity frames, but if you thought maybe a better strategy would be to decouple those walls and maybe detach the frame at the corners to reduce that compression strut. Mm -hmm. But maybe then to prevent aeroplane fa failure, uh, do NSM anchored to the walls, but allow some movement. I wonder if you think that would be probably uh, a little bit uh, better for the seismic performance of the building. Uh, it, definitely another use of the package. Our, our motivation for, for keeping the walls in there was we, we wanted to avoid uh, soft story failure. And not just that, we might lose a wall here and there, and then you just start to change the, the dynamics of the whole building, and they start to twist and what they weren't expected to do. But it, yeah, again, a, another great use of the model. Yeah. So that, that's another PhD project there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, very nice. Um, I think my comment is in the continuation of the previous comments. So uh, I think now we have a lot of materials that have. Um, some of them very toughness behavior, another ones are very high tensile strength, like the FRPs. There are also the FRCs, that mm -hmm. was concrete. And it seems to me that uh, my experience uh, in the uh, use of, uh, that is not quite high, in use of FRP for measuring, we realize that in terms of when uh, they are submitting many to wet dry conditions, they have a tendency to be one. So it's, it's dramatic the long-term behavior of this materials and it's so brittle, so straight. So one constantly, I think it would be nice for us for the future to explore using the model to, uh, to use this more, I don't know if, uh, if you are going this direction or not, using uh, layers that can be applied with short grid with, with these uh, strainer materials in critical zones when we need, when we need that 
and using the FRP in the people. So that when we are shear, and shear, in fact, in the columns or even uh, confinement, in this case, the CFRP is very nice, or the FRP is very nice. So this is like a, a combination and taking the benefits of each material for what we want. If we want load carrying capacity, it's okay. If we want also more energy dissipation, yeah, they're great. Thank, thanks for the comments. There is not much research in this field on, say, frames, application of strengthening, retrofit, whatever the, the scheme is, optimal positions. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an area of ripe for, for much more research. And, and this tool is, a, is, is one tool that can be used. This is a, it's a great optimization problem. So just in the optimization field, and I don't know of any work or collaboration being done in that field uh, and, and in our field. Anyway, there's another PhD project for you. Very good. Thank you, Scott. Thank you.